thank you everyone for joining us. Um, as you're probably aware, uh, PacBio has been in the long read sequencing game for quite a while, uh, but there are some key innovations um, that are very relevant to cancer research and oncology that we would like to discuss today. Uh, cancer is an extremely complex disease or sets of diseases, and we, um, we need to be able to take a really a multi-omic approach to understanding it. So ideally, uh, we should have the tools um, that can interrogate the full genome, uh, the complete transcriptome, and the complete epigenome. As you'll see today, we are now at the point that we can have a single platform that can do this at scale, as you can see on the right with our new Revio system. By leveraging the most accurate long read sequencing technology available, we can now offer the most complete genomes, transcriptomes, and epigenomes. And we recently announced uh, this methylation calling detection directly from whole genome sequencing to look at uh, the epigenome, as I said. Um, we know that cancer is a disease of the genome, but a lot of the effects of these mutations show up on the level of RNA. That is the focus of today's webinar. On the right, you can see examples of different types of RNA dysregulation in cancer. These are splicing isoforms, RNA fusions, express mutations, RNA editing, etc., which have all been shown to drive tumor genesis and help us understand this uh, terrible disease. Right now, most cancer transcriptome studies um, are only looking at gene expression, which can be done via uh, qPCR, expression arrays, and short read se uh, RNA sequencing. However, when you take these approaches, this misses most of the information that resides within the transcriptome. Um, as you'll hear from Arthur Dondi in a second, only accurate long read, long read sequencing can detect all of these RNA variants um, in uh, uh, tumor samples. I'll use the example of one RNA variant um, just to showcase the power of long read sequencing. Uh, one key aspect of RNA dysregulation is, as many of you know, al alternative splicing. Um, in normal cells, as depicted here, each gene produces several isoforms, not just one transcript, which are different combinations of the exons of the gene, as you can see on the left. These isoforms are then translated into proteins, shown on the right, with different domain structures and often different functions. Um, in normal cells, uh, more than 95% of genes undergo alternative splicing, with a rough estimate of about four, four splice isoforms per gene. Now, the problem is when we do short read sequencing and take those approaches, um, it's shown on the left. Um, when you have to align these short fragments to a reference genome, and really only able to reconstruct an estimated 20 to 40% at the most of the transcriptome. So this intrinsic limitation in the discovery of novel isoforms likely underestimate, we know underestimates the impact of isoforms in cancer and result in really a partial view of the true biology of cancer. Um, when we use PacBio uh, long read sequencing, accurate long read sequencing as shown on the right, um, you're able to directly read out the RNA isoform with no assembly. Um, so using a method called isoseq, which has been around for quite a while, it really gives you a full complete um, view of the transcriptome because you're sequencing the transcript all the way from the five prime to the three prime end of the molecule. So you're seeing biology as it is. Um, a recent publication from the Jackson Lab in the US uh, utilized uh, both long read and short read sequencing to better understand the RNA isoform uh, landscape of breast cancer in this example. So really did the first uh, true comparison of these two technology with regards to um, isoform discovery. Um, in this paper, um, they sequenced 26 tumor samples and performed both uh, short read and accurate long read RNA sequencing using the isoseq method. Um, as you can see on the right, they discover over 140,000 uh, spice isoform uh, using the long read methodology. And compared to the short read approach, two thirds of these uh, new isoforms were completely novel. So really this showcases the ability of long read RNA sequencing via isoseq to provide significantly more powerful isoform discovery than short read sequencing. Now, this study was done in bulk, uh, but we know that tumors are extremely heterogeneous, probably the most heterogeneous uh, tissue type that we'll see in, in biology. And that means that every cell uh, within the tumor is different. When we perform bulk RNA-seq, what we are getting is an average readout, as many of you know, of the expression across all different types of cells, as shown on the left. Um, to truly understand the biology of, of cancer and tumors, we need to perform 
single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, this means isolating each cell, uh, sequencing all of the RNA which, within each individual cell. Um, and this gives us the picture of the different cell types that exist within the tumor, how they relate to each other, and what transcripts are expressed in each. Um, a new method, which is very relevant to the work that um, Arthur Dondi will present in, in a few minutes, um, called ISOSEQ, was developed at the Broad Institute to achieve uh, accessible and cost-effective RNA sequencing of full-length RNAs using the ISOSEQ method. So this is a highly scalable, um, cost-competitive method. Um, as you can see on the left, this method allows for gene expression measurements and cell type clustering that is equivalent to short read sequencing. Those are the TISNI plots shown on the left, where you can see that at equivalent um, sequencing depth and cost, we're achieving the very similar uh, clustering um, via TISNI plots. Um, however, as you can see on the right, this method also allows you to overlay additional information, such as isoforms. As you can see on the right, you have uh, TISNI plots with um, isoform information overlaid onto the clustering. So now at the single cell level, you can get uh, additional information to gene expression, such as isoforms, but you also, as you can see from Arthur Dondi's um, study in a second, also um, fusions um, and express mutations. So we believe, and um, we're now starting to see the studies coming out, that this is really the way to do RNA sequencing. Um, so you don't keep on missing important information. And we know that in cancer, that is um, additionally uh, important since there are a lot of, there's a lot of information that resides within the transcriptome, such as isoforms, fusions, express mutations, and gene expression that are interesting to understanding uh, cancer biology. Uh, so with that, I would like to now hand this off to Arthur Dondi, who will present uh, on his work on the topic of detecting uh, cancer-related RNA dysregulation with long read sequencing. A lot, Jonathan. And uh, well, let's start with a biological question. So, if you have high grade serous ovarian cancer patient arriving to the clinic, well, sadly, there is a strong chance, as it's a cancer that is de detected late, there is a strong chance that this patient will present metastasis. Now, you have a bi metastasis biopsy and a healthy tissue biopsy. Your goal will be to find sources of immunogenic mutated peptides called neoantigens that you can be that can be targeted in cancer and in cancer cells only. For this, your sequencing requirements are to find in the same cells to simultaneously cluster cells and determine the cell types because, as I said, you want it to be cancer specific and you don't want to target any other type of cells. You want to capture full-length spliced isoforms because, as Jonathan said before, uh, those are sources of RNA dysregulations. And finally, you want to detect genetic alterations in cancer that are sources of neoantigens. So quickly, before 10 years ago, with bulk analysis, uh, as Jonathan said, you couldn't know uh, what was happening in uh, cancer cells specifically. And especially with cancer, the, there is some, sometimes in your biopsy, you will have maybe some things like 10 to 15% of cancer cells only, and then your signal will be buried under other type of cells, such as immune cells or tissue cells. Hopefully 10 years ago, single cell analysis arrived, and then we, we are able to identify cancer cells only and even to find subclones. However, so far, at least with telix genomics, this only revealed the um, gene expression and not anything else. So you miss a lot of cancer information, such, such as the genomic alteration, the genetic mutations and gene fusion, and also the transcriptomic alterations and the alternative splicing. And now, as Jonathan said, with long read sequencing, this is possible, and that's what we decided to do. Now, let me explain you a bit the differences between short and long read sequencing. We've used both in our study. We use the Illumina Nova Seq platform, that is uh, short read sequencing two times 150 base pairs, 2,000 uh, gigabytes of data, the uh, gigabases, sorry, of data per run and a low sequencing error rate of 
We also use then the, for the long reads, we use the pack bio SQL to platform that have a sequencing of a length of between like the optimal is between 15 and 20,000 base pairs. And uh, it has a low sequencing depth of around 24 giga bases per run, at least with pack bio SQL 2. Now with review, it will be much more. And uh, a sequencing error rate that is also quite low. And now, why uh, is short, uh, why is long read sequencing better than bulk? Well, Jonathan already explained it, so I will do it quickly. But basically, in short reads, you don't the risk don't cover the whole gene. You only cover maximum two exons simultaneously. So you will maybe know the connectivity between this exon and this exon, like this read, for example, mapping maps to this exon and this exon. However, you don't know if this exon here is connected to this one or not. And you can only, from this data set, you can only, for example, here infer those four isoforms, but you don't know if they are expressed express or not. Now, with long reads, you directly observe isoforms because the reads are long enough to cover the whole gene. So basically, you cover all the exons. And in this uh, mock example, you can see that, for example, instead of having those four possibilities, you actually have only in the same data set, you will only have two isoforms that are expressed, this one and this one. And then you observe them, you don't need to infer them anymore. And that's for bulk. Now, uh, one specificity for, of single cell is that for the 10 genomics, at least, you capture the uh, isoforms, the, tra the RNA transcripts, on the free prime end using their poly A tail. And then you fragment the RNA which means that you will end up with RNA that is only covering the three prime ends. And you have very seldom information on the five prime, meaning that you cannot even infer isoforms anymore. You just basically can count reads per gene and that's it. While with the long read on the single cell, you still capture on the three prime also, you capture the same way. However, as you don't fragment the RNA, you keep everything and you cover still the wall read. So if there is a mutation happening, for example, here on this exon, well, you will be able to see it, while with short reads, you will not be able to see it. And I will show you like real life examples of this later. All right, now, how did we do it? Basically, well, from your uh, metastasis and healthy tissue uh, biopsies, you generate a barcoded uh, single cell cDNA library with each read belonging to one particular cell. And usually what you will do in short reads, that is the, it's a golden standard, you will fragment those reads here and it will give something like that. So short reads. And in 2018, Hagen Tigner lab had the idea of preserving the whole barcoded library instead of uh, fragmented it, fragmenting it, sorry and to add pack bio adapters and to se sequencing the full isoforms using long read sequencing. And that's exactly what we did with our ovarian cancer samples. We sequenced both on the short read and the long reads in the same cells, which enables us to have a direct comparison. comparison sorry. And uh, we applied it to a small cancer, ovarian cancer uh, data set. So only three ovarian cancer patients, five samples, three cancer samples, one for each patient and two healthy samples to compare with the cancer samples basically. In each sample we had 500 cells and we use matched, as I said, short and long read sCRNA sequencing in all, like match in all the cells. We had both our short read and long read RNA sequencing. So if you remember before I said that the optimal length for pack biosequencing is between 15 to 20,000 base pairs. However, the RNA length in uh, human at least is the mean is around 2,000 base pairs. So you basically lose a lot of the power that long read sequencing has to offer because you have reads that are 10 times shorter than the optimal length. So recently, uh, there was the MassSeq technology that was developed that is basically concatenating the RNA, the cDNAs together uh, to make one long molecule that can be sequenced. And bioinformatically, then you can refine which reads, like basically divide again those reads. And you, this way you uh, expand your uh, sequencing depth, you increase your sequencing depth 
uh, without almost any cost, at least without sequencing costs. So this is called the massive technology. However, at the time of our study, we uh, massive didn't exist, and uh, instead there was a technology called HITS Cytosic that was also using the concatenation, but with less power. We we could uh, concatenate less reads, and my colleague Ulrike Lichetti was able to reverse engineer uh, their protocol and here are the first results that we could uh, generate so comparing directly uh, single cell isoseq normal without concatenation and hit isoseq from normalized number of uh, unique high quality reads here if after an um, sorry <laughs> in concatenation we were able to have three times more throughput three times more reads uh, so basically, there were a mean of three reads per uh, molecule. And the advantage of using concatenation is that you select naturally, because you try to concatenate, you look for adapters on both sides. So you naturally select the um, reads that have both correct adapters on both sides, and you remove all the artifacts that can be generated during library preparation which for the first time we tried the heat size of CQ lead, led us to a six times increase in uh, molecules, which was very nice to have more power. And using this technology, we generated a sequencing data set for all our five samples of a total of 211 million reads, which is to our knowledge, the biggest data sets in single cell of uh, long read ever created. And uh, it, it resulted in 12,000 reads per cell in uh, average. And this data set was so big that the usual tools to use to look at isoseq ISO were not able to process it. So I had to create my own snake make pipeline that you can find here. And basically this snake make pipeline was, is able to, by divided the workload per cell to integrate multiple samples at the same time and have one unified isoform library at the end and you can find it on github it's available and uh, well with that let's look, look at what the data looks like so the first thing usually you do when you do long green uh, not long it's right single cell uh, sequencing is that you try to characterize the cell type of the cells that you have in your samples and you try to cluster them. So we characterized the cell type using the short read information first. And as you can see, we found both immune cells, T cells, B cells, and myelo myeloid cells, but also tissue cells such as mesothelial cells, fibroblasts, and also of course cancer cells. And um well first we also did the clustering uh using short reads data so short read gene expression data and you can see that the for example here the t cells they cluster well together so you have this t cell cluster is mainly blue meaning that it's mainly t cells in it and also the tissue cells in general cluster quite well together and especially the cancer cells here so so far all good and we did the same thing using the long read expression, gene expression. So as I said before, this is the same cells here in short read and long read, those are the same cells. And you can see that they cluster exactly the same basically. And uh, when we uh, did the jacquard distance comparison between the, the clusters, for example, the cluster, like the cancer cluster here, it's 96% of the cells present in this cluster in short reads are also present in the cancer cluster in long reads, meaning that basically they, the, the results are the same in long and short read, which is expected, but it's always good to validate. And uh, now this is for long read gene level, but as I said before, while with short read you can only have gene level uh, expression, with long read you also can have isoform expression, which is a more fine-grained uh, data set. And so that we basically did also the clustering using the isoforms and instead of the gene expression in long reads and as you can see the data structures is once again well preserved and the jacquard distance is also very good here between the short reads and the isoform long reads meaning that uh, basically you can also use this uh, more fine grade data to maybe try to find more clusters that was not the case for us we didn't find more clusters because so we have 
low number of cells. However, recently, uh, Gendol lab in uh, Pennsylvania, I think, found, for example, a new cluster using this technique. And um, now that's okay, sorry. Now this was only for um, the cell typing was only done with using short read, meaning that you still need the short reads in this analysis. But we wanted to see: can you get rid of short read and can and only use long read? Can you basically retrieve all the information you will see in short reads with long reads? So for that, we tried to look at the cell typing using the long reads this time. And as you can see here, the embedding is the same. However, the colors changed a bit because the basically each cell was had uh, their cell type assessed individually using the long read expression. And once again, the well, the coloring basically of the clusters is still quite coherent. And uh, if we look, for example, at uh, T cells here, the T cells in short read, the T cells, you have 97% of the T cell cluster is composed of T cells, so blue points. And in long reads, 96% here of the long read cluster, T cells cluster is composed of T cells also. Basically, we could, and uh, the results are still also quite coherent for all the cell types. And basically, that means that you can also determine the cell type using the long read, and you don't need the short read. So if you want to set cost, you can also just, if you want an isoform analysis, you can only use short, no long reads without the need for short reads. All right. And the next step in this type of uh, study, so when you look at uh, single cell RNA sequencing, well, in cancer, especially in cancer transcriptomic, the next step will be to look at uh, differential gene expression. So basically, are some genes more expressed in cancer cells than in other cell types? And uh, this is now the what I found to be the most interesting result in our study because when we looked at uh, the top results, we found that in one patient specifically, TESPA1 was the top differentially expressed uh, gene in short reads. However, as you can see here, so 3,000 reads were um, in cancer cells and nothing in other cells. While if you look at long reads, this is not true at all. You still have this uh, small expression because here the scale is different. You have uh, the same type of expression in uh, the T cells because TESPA1 is a T cell gene. So you have low expression in T cells. However, the expression that you would expect in uh, cancer cells because you saw it in short reads is not present in long reads. And that was very disturbing because uh, as I showed before, the short read and long read expression like the clustering was very similar. So it's very surprising to see such a big difference between the two technologies. And it's only once we started looking at fusion genes that we understood the reason for it. Because when looking at the fusion genes, we found using the long reads only because short read cannot find fusion genes. We found a fusion genes called IGF2BP2 TESPA1. So it's a fusion between TESPA1 and IGF2BP2. And this fusion is present only in patient two as uh, the TESPA1 expression in short read and only in cancer cells almost. So basically you have the same type of profile between the, this fusion and the TESPA1 short read expression. And to, to show you now the structure of the fusion, IGF2BP2. So here you have IGF2BP2 and TESPA1 wild type. And the fusion is composed of the four first exons of IGF2BP2 and the free prime UTR of TESPA1. And if you remember well, as I said before, in, in uh, single cell sequencing, you only, in short reads, you only sequence the free prime site. So basically, the free prime UTR is the only part that is sequenced. And then this TESPA1 expression in short read could be both linked to the white of TESPA1 or the fusion TESPA1 here because you also have the free prime UTR. And to investigate that, we actually looked at reads mapping to the free prime UTR of TESPA1. And this is the result. So here, that's the free prime UTR of TESPA1 here. And those are the short reads here mapping to those to, to this uh, TESPA1 UTR. And uh, if you look at those three positions, those three positions are all mutated. So here is a G mutation, here is a mutation. And basically, yes, 100% of the reads mapping to the free prime UTR are in short reads, 100% are mutated in those three positions. 
However, in the long reads, the reads mutate, the reads uh, aligning to the TESPA three, TESPA one three prime UTR. There are some reads that are also have those free mutations, but there are also some reads that have no mutations. And basically, it's a B allelic expression. You have a triple mutated allele here and a non mutated allele here. And uh, well, that's expected. That's expected to have two alleles. That's very possible, especially the, in the free prime UTR. You often have uh, mutations like this. And now, if you, we look at the reads that are the TESPA, the fusion reads, so IGF two BP two TESPA one fusion reads mapping to the TESPA one free prime UTR, you can see that it's once again uh, only mutation. So it's all the reads are one hundred percent mutated. They're all mutated on these those three positions, which is expected because you have, as it's a gen genomic uh, fusion, that, that's a fusion coming from a genomic event, well, you expect to have it on only one allele and not on two alleles. So that's normal to see a 100% uh, of mutation because you only expect one allele. And as you can see, this profile of 100% mutation everywhere is also is the same as the short reads because most likely the short read expression in this part one UTR is actually the expression of the fusion here and not of the wild type test part one. And that means that basically uh, this not only TESPA, not only uh, short reads were not is not able to detect this uh, fusion here that is very highly expressed, but in top of that it erroneously consider the TESPA, this TESPA1 expression, that the free prime UTR of the fusion, as a wild type TESPA1 expression. And if you want, you would want to investigate this uh, highly expressed TESPA1, this differentially expressed gene, you would lose money and investigate in something that is uh, basically a technical artifact in short read. And we validated this uh, fusion using also other ways. We used uh, single cell DNA, to validate and find the, the mutation, the breakpoint of the fusion. And we also remapped the reads mapping on the breakpoint. So basically reads mapping here in short reads and read mapping here. And we tried to remap it, remap them by proposing them this uh, fusion as one possible reference. And 96% of the reads mapping here and here actually decided to map preferentially to the fusion because they were basically fusion reads in short reads also. But without knowing this fusion reference, you couldn't find this. Uh, so you need basically long read for this. All right. Now that's one way to find a neoti antigen because this fusion here, the breakpoint is uh, not like is something that is not present in non-cancer cells. And basically you could try to target this. But there are other ways of finding uh, no antigens. For example, the new isoforms because one new isoform that will be uh, expressed only in cancer cells could be easily, that like you could easily think of uh, targeting it if there is something different from the other isoforms to target in those cancer cells. But first, let me explain you how to classify isoforms. So for this, we used the Squanti classification from the Anaconesa lab. And basically this classification consists of taking one reference here the like one isoform reference, here the gen code reference, and to compare the, the isoforms that we find to this. And there are multiple possibilities. One isoform that we find can be a full splice match to the reference, basically a one-to-one -one, uh, exact same as the reference, and this would be categorized as the full splice match. Could also be an incomplete splice match, basically a one-to-one -one except one part is missing because the read is incomplete. And then you can have the novel isoforms. And uh, there are two types of novel isoforms. One, the ones with known junctions, for example, you have this junction here. So here, this junction is basically jumping. There is one uh, exon that is uh, skipped, one exon skipped, yes. And uh, th this junction is known. And there is also the novel not in catalog type of novel isoforms where the junction is novel because you have this point here, that this junction here, that, that is not present in the gene code reference. And you have other type of uh, isoforms you can find, such as, for example, the gene fusion that uh, I showed before with uh, IGF2BP2, TESPA1 fusion. And now in our data, 
24 million of the reads, meaning 80% of our data is full spice match, meaning is known isoforms, which is quite reassuring because you expect to see that a lot of the RNA you see is known, known transcripts. And around 11% of the reads were uh, belonging to new isoforms still. So that's still quite a lot, 3 million reads belonging to new isoforms. But that's for all the reads. Now, if you take only one read per isoform, so you, if you can only, if you look only at the isoforms, you have a nice distribution of 33% of full splice match, and then 30% of here, the purple and green new isoforms. Meaning that a third of your data is not all your data, a third of all the isoforms that you find are actually novel isoforms. So out of the more than uh, 200,000 isoforms we found, 60,000 were novel isoforms, accounting for 3.3 million reads. Now, usually when you say that uh, a third of your data is novel, uh, a lot of people will sometimes ask you, how do you know that this is true? How do you know that this is not some artifacts? How do you validate those results? And in human, we have the chance to have uh, experimental five prime and three prime database. So cage, peak database and poly A database. And we could compare our isoforms, see if both, so the, free, the five prime here of our isoform and the three prime was matching the experimental database of uh, five prime and three prime. And what we found is that around 80% of the novel isoforms we found are, were indeed uh, matching the experimental databases, which is even a little bit more than the known ones, surprisingly. So basically the new isoforms, they have a five prime and three prime support that is comparable to the known ones. And that is not so far away from the most curated data, isoform database created so far, which is GenCode main here. It's close to 100% of support. So that's a first uh, very reassuring thing, but we wanted to be even more sure that our isoforms are actually true ones, novel isoforms are actually true ones. And for this, we decided to basically look at the biotype and we sent our, we asked to GenCode basically to look at our new isoforms and to validate them and to characterize the, their biotype, which they nicely did. And if you look here, the novel isoforms, they have a biotype profiles that is very similar to the Genco data database one, meaning that once again, we have data that is of at least same quality, if not higher than the existing databases. And we have even more protein coding here, even more protein coding isoforms than the Genco database in percentage. And meaning that out of the 68,000 uh, isoforms we sent, 40,000 isoforms were considered as novel by the Genco team, which if they will be added uh, to the Genco database will make, make more than 50% of novel isoforms to the database. Meaning that in one study, we found 15% more than the existing database in isoforms. That basically, that means that overall the uh, sorry. Overall, the transcriptome, human transcriptome, is far, far away from being completely characterized. And if in one study you can find that much, and as also uh, Jonathan said before in the, the SUSA study, they also found thousands of new isoforms. Well, there is basically a lot, lot more to unveil. And especially in cancer now, 50,000 of the nosal isoform found, they are cancer specific, which is a lot, right? So that's basically, that's uh, as much as potential uh, therapy targets here. And if we look at the percentage of isoforms that are unique to their cell type, basically 8% of the isoforms in cancer cells are unique to cancer cells and they are not found in other, can in other cell types in our data set, which is huge. And also those isoforms, they uh, like a, more than a third, like more, more than two thirds, sorry, of them are actually uh, novel. Meaning that there are thousands of uh, possible targets that uh, need to be investigated, basically. And uh, here is now an example of uh, something a bit more subtle because before here, sorry, we looked at things that were basically unique, so really binary, but then you also can have differential isoform expression where 
you have, if it's not 100% difference of uh, expression, you still have differences between cancer and healthy cells. And here, you have rate mapping to IGF-1, and you can see that in cancer cells, the cancer cells use mainly transcript using the exon 2 here. So this is exon, sorry, this is exon 2. Transcript using this exon as the starting exon here, while in the healthy cells, transcripts are mainly using the exon 1 here. And this is using long reads. And now if we use short reads, well, sadly, you cannot see anything because basically the coverage is only on the free prime side, as I told you before. But here, that's a real life example of it. In that's in one patient, in our patient one, you can see that here the expression is non-existent on the five prime, so you cannot discover this type of uh, things. And now if we take a closer look to the free prime, uh, to the five prime, sorry, uh, and you can see that uh, these isoforms using the second exon here are called class two, and in cancer cells it's mainly those, while in healthy cells it's only the class one, so isoform using this exon here that are expressed. And if we look at the U map now, well, the overall IGF-1 expression is shared between fibroblasts, mesothelial cells, and the cancer cells, while the while in if we look at in more detail to the isoforms expressed, well, uh, the non-cancer cells, the healthy cells, they express mainly here. Though. So the fibroblasts here. They express mainly class one, while the cancer cells here they express mainly class two, and that's something that uh, you would miss with, as you can see here, you don't have this information in short reads. All right, that was now for the um, isoform expression, but the, as I said also before, another type of uh, neoantigen source is the mutations, and here is a view in patient one of TP53, and TP53 uh, is, well, a very uh, known gene in cancer. And as you can see, in short reads, once again, suddenly you have only free prime coverage. And the coverage after that drops very, very seriously. There, there is almost no coverage on the 5 prime end, basically. While if you look at the long reads in both cancer and healthy cells, while you have also distribution that is skewed more to the free prime side, you still have coverage all along the gene, basically. And if you now zoom on exon 4 here, uh, you can see that, uh, well, there is a coding mutation appearing here. And uh, if we zoom on it, you can see that this mutation is actually 100 present in all the cancer cells. And while in the healthy cells, it's not present at all. And which means that we have here a TP53 uh, cancer specific mutation. That is this detected using long reads. And in short reads, actually, you can see that there are only two reads covering this position. Those two reads are indeed uh, mutated. So they must be, well, they are actually uh, cancer reads, but it's only two reads and no mutation color will actually try to call mutation with a coverage of two, basically. So you will miss this. And if you look now at, and this, by the way, this uh, mutation here was Confirm using panel sequencing, RNA panel, uh, RNA, uh, DNA, sorry, panel sequencing, and uh, it was confirmed in this patient. And now, if you look at uh, the UMAP once again, you can see that the somatic mutations we found are indeed all located in the cancer cells. And with this, uh, I, I will conclude. Using long grid sequencing, we could determine cell types and uh, visualize embeddings which are matching to the short read sequencing, we found more than 40,000 novel isoforms validated by the Genco team. We established a catalog of isoform splicing in cancer cells. And finally, we identified potential cancer neoantigens from three types of sources. First, alternative the isoform usage, such, such as uh, IGF-1 class 2 in cancer, Gene fusions such as IGF2BP2, TESPA1, and finally bulk mutations such as TP53P151H. You can find those results in our preprint here. And with that, I want to thank you all for listening. I want also to thank uh, my colleagues, my PI, Nico Berenwinkel, Christian Basil that designed this project, Ulrike Lichetti that did the experiments, and Nico Borgsmuller for his help with the pipeline and with his help also with the writing of the manuscript. Thanks a lot.